really happened. So just to summarize about the ICDs, we discussed about its history, what are the different components of uh, the device in fact, how do they work and in fact how can we even distinguish between the different arrhythmias uh, with the usage of ICD and of course the therapies as well which we had discussed. So now coming to what happens when a magnet is applied over ICD. So this is a typical thing what happens is uh, a lot of times we come across this if there is a procedure which is scheduled so the cardiologist tends to advise uh, try to apply a magnet so whenever there is a surgery uh, or then sometimes it is advised. So it is applied uh, as, so I think we already discussed this topic as well last time. So there are different response however yes when surgery is being done otherwise you don't uh, want the you know uh, the uh, the function to be there for a temporary basis and all that is the time when you apply that in fact. So yes this was the topic. So what are the therapies which is delivered by the ICD? So as we already said it there are low power therapies, high power therapies. The low power therapies are the ones which is typically like the pacing therapy. So we had already shared some of the information especially in the earlier lecture was anti-tachycardia pacing and the bradyarrhythmia pacing and the high power is the one which includes the cardioversion and defibrillation. So the ta anti-tachycardia pacing so it's like its name so what happens is if there is a re-entry circuit and there is an excitable gap is over there so it tends to pace at a higher rate than the tachycardia which may be able to break that re-entry circuit in fact okay so this is the step-by-step -step, uh, uh, method how it goes through so re-entry uh, is initiated the arrhythmia is there so then the ATP is going to be delivered as I said it at a higher rate slightly higher rate than the tachyarrhythmia and due to the collision of the wavefront so what will happen is the tachycardia may stop or gets terminated in fact so and it of course it is programmable programmable in the sense so what happens is whenever the tachycardia is detected so in this session we will try to focus quite a lot upon the practical uh, things what or how do you see uh, the ECG strip will be there the rhythm strip is going to be there in front of you or the x-rays are going to be there in front of you and you may have to diagnose or recognize what is the problem which is happening okay so for example if you get a strip like this so what is really happening over here? So this initial three beats are the ones it shows the detection of the tachycardia which the patient is having. After that you start noticing is there is something else as well. Some additional spikes are there. So this is what is the sequence one. Okay. And then therapy was given and then later on you see there are some gaps. So again after that what you have you observe is there are those tachycardia beats. After that further Again, those spikes are seen. So that is the sequence two. So what is really happening is, again, the tachycardia continues. Then again, we notice something else. So we can name it as a sequence three. Then after passage of time, again, the tachycardia tends to continue. And then again, there's something is happening over here. So what is it actually? What is happening over here? So as I was telling you, Whenever it then detects a tachycardia, it may be able to detect a therapy like this. So this is not really just uh, particular to the ICD, but it can be even uh, present in the pacemakers as well. So as I was telling you, is this is a programmable feature. So you can determine the number of pulses per sequence it should be given. Okay. So what is happening is, if the R interval was like 350 milliseconds, which is which can be present in the form of a ventricular tachycardia or even a fast VT as well. So the first sequence is being given at 320, right? So this is what is the S1. S1 stands for stimulus one. So, uh, so so this is what it happens. So tachycardia is sensed, sense, 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 sense. Tachycardia is going on at the rate of like uh, 290 to 300 milliseconds. So that is the time after that the pacing uh, interval or the pacing starts happening and as we can notice it clearly over here this is at the 91% in fact of the tachycardia.
okay so 91 percent of 300 milliseconds is how much or 90 percent so it will be 270 milliseconds so 91 percent to be precise will be like 273 milliseconds however so around 207 milliseconds so now coming to the other one so what is called as so we saw this was called as anti tachycardia pacing so for example what happens in the burst pacing so in the burst pacing what is going to happen is a fixed interval is going to be delivered at equal intervals okay so what we see there's a tachycardia there's a VT or fast VT at 350 milliseconds which is happening so then the sequence is given at 320 milliseconds at regular intervals so if you look carefully over here in the burst pacing all these intervals are all the same so the VT is detected over here at 350 milliseconds okay and this burst pacing is being done over here so later on again the VT was detected Again, the burst pacing was done over here. So, for example, if you look carefully, the A sense, so atrial sense is there. So, after that is the V pace, V pace, V pace. And that's how you do the burst pacing, in fact. Okay. So, the other, uh, uh, I hope you already understood the concept of burst. So, something else is called as ramp pacing. So, what is ramp pacing? So, in the ramp pacing, what happens is, this is also a little similar to burst however the pacing interval keeps decreasing by at least 10 milliseconds okay so it is delivered at a decreasing interval so the initial one was 320 milliseconds next one 310 300 290 so what do we notice over here so similarly the tachycardia is there then after that these are these anti tachycardia pacing however if we notice the initial one was like at 320 then 310 300 290 so this is classical of what is called as a ramp pacing so these are also slightly basics of the ep studies as well so in the ep studies as well we do try to uh, practice a lot of these things in fact so so now what is happening over here so similar thing as i said it if we look carefully at the RI interval, if it is like 350 milliseconds, then the first sequence, the first sequence was what? So it is continuously paced at 320. So this is like a burst pacing. However, when the tachycardia is again continuing, then we see there are different pacing beats as well, but it decreases. 320 becomes 310, 300, 290. So this is more of a ramp pacing. Okay. So this is the th same thing which is happening, the difference between the programmed values. So how you can program the number of pulses should be given, how many sequences should be given as well, okay? And how much should be the decrement as well? For example, if you're planning a ramp, so for example, you can decrease that 10 or someone wants like even at uh, 20 as well. Similarly, for example, R to S1, should it be 91%, should it be 87%? So, but this are the common values as I said it. Decrement is at 10 milliseconds. R to S1 is determined at around 91%. Similarly, <coughs> and the number of S S1 pulses can be like 4 or even 8 beats as well. Okay. So, this you can always program it up. So, now I, I hope you already understood the anti-tachycardia pacing, which is done at a lower power. So there are a few things which is also done at a higher power. So which I had already said it is something is called as cardioversion and defibrillation. So there is significant difference between the cardioversion and defibrillation. What is the difference? So I had already said the difference last time. <clears throat> so cardioversion is more of a non-committed shock therapy so it gets synchronized to the r wave and then it gets delivered okay and mostly for the re tachycardias you're trying to use so for example over here if you will notice there is a ventricular ventricular beat okay so ventricle sensing is there v sense v sense v sense and then comes a synchronized cardioversion and this is synchronized 
to the R wave, right? And and what happens is, uh, yes, it aborts if the synchronization cannot be obtained due to the arrhythmia termination. So, for example, it is a smart mechanism as well. Only if the tachycardia is good there, then the cardioversion should happen. Otherwise, of course, when there is tachycardia, it terminates on its own. What is the need for that? Not at all. Okay, so this is a classical leaflet. You are going to see whenever... Uh, you, you will be doing the programming for the device. So what will happen is, so you will see over here. So for example, what type of therapy should be given? Burst, burst, burst. Okay. So similarly, for example, the R to S1, which I was telling you, know, that should it be 91%, 84% or how much should be. Similarly, S, S1, S2, the ramp, which should be done. So how much should be the percentage RR? As I was telling you, so we already said it about. Then similarly, how much should be the Interval for the decremental pacing. Whenever we are trying to decrease the frequency, should be 20 seconds, 20 milliseconds, 10 milliseconds, like that. Similarly, about the sequence, should be 3, 4, or even sometimes, as I said, it up to 8. So, especially whenever we are doing a EP pacing and all, we try to give at least 8 extras, in fact. Okay? And then, after the first one has been given, second one has been given as well, that is the time it will give us Rx3. So, what is this is for shock. So in the shock, as you can see, the first one is like 30 joules. It will be given, in fact. Okay? So these are the parameters which one should be uh, having a look as well. And it is very important, in fact, to go through. Okay? So... After knowing about the programming, uh, now so I, I had already said it, the cardioversion is something different, defibrillation is something different. So defibrillation is more of a, it doesn't get synchronized to the R wave, okay? So this is more like a emergency measure. So whenever there's an unstable patient, just defibrillate. For example, there's a VF, defibrillate, okay? So if you look carefully over here, this is a very fast... Uh, VT, okay. So what is happening is ATP is given, anti-tachycardia pacing, okay. And then patient gets into the sinus rhythm. However, in the second one, the fast VT is there. So RA intervals, if you look carefully, it's very, very fast. So what you have to do over there is you try to give a cardioversion shock. And then there resumption of a slower rhythm in fact same thing is being done over here which is the vf ventricular fibrillation these ava intervals are coarse very very fast and that is the reason you try to give a defibrillation shock and after that the sinus rhythm is resumed so what is happening over here in the programming further so in the pro programming further as well as i said it there can be different statuses as well in the terms of so for example if it detects a vf so the treatment one okay you can notice over here the energy the first shock is of like 26 joules the second one is like 30 joules it's like okay so like this and of course it should be given only after the initiation has been detected so once we are done with this as well so a question comes to our mind when does the device call a therapy a success when is it going to be success so that's why i was telling you uh, it is a rule what is called as eight to terminate rule whose microphone is on please mute your microphone So what is 8 to terminate rule? So what happens is, um, you should always watch out at least for 8 sinus or pace beats outside the slowed program detection zone. So over here, for example, what is happening is, if you look carefully on the ECGs, there are two spikes, distinct spikes you can see, right? So what is happening is, these are the 
so what is happening over here so these are the paste beats okay and the termination counter will keep on observing the tachycardia has stopped or not so it is going to at least even after giving the therapy at least it will watch out for at least eight beats outside the slope program detection show so this is more of a system which is present in medtronic devices actually so if you look carefully so but uh, the different companies have also um, adapted to this uh, mechanism and they are trying to use it in their own system as well so what is happening over here is the ICD system issues there are some system issues as well so these are also uh, technical tools so they can have their own problems as well in the sense like a lead system or connections can be the issues with the device or otherwise yes uh, electromagnetic interferences or even the patients can be there so how do we do the troubleshooting of these devices actually so let's try to see the connection so what happens is a simple question for all of you so in an ICD system what component is generally known to be the source of most common issues is it the device or is it the leads anyone would like to answer this Device. So, how many devices have you integrated? Hmm. So, someone said device. What about others? What others think? So, others don't think anything. So, for example, even if we we'll try to generalize it about, for example, the pacemakers, is it the problem with the device or is it the leads? So, the most common problem tends to happen is with the leads. And the leads, the problem, where it does it happen? So, you can again divide it in terms of acute problems or the chronic problems. Acute problems are the ones uh, mostly seen like wherever you are trying to connect it, uh, in the you know the can of the uh, device otherwise this lodgement can happen for example wherever you insert it okay there as well or the perforation can also happen in fact however whenever you are trying to think in terms of the chronic problems chronic problems what happens is the common problems will be like you know at the points of high points of stress or pressure so there can be lead fracture, even lead insulation break can also happen. So which is exhibited at the areas of high impedance or resistance or similarly also at the lead insulation break. Okay, so the commonly it tends to exhibit the low impedance or resistance in fact. Why does this problem happen? The problem of the lead failure because this tends to happen because the lead has to go through a lot of different anatomical sites anatomical sites like the initial area which is close to the connector it has to go through the first rib clavicle area then through the valve and of course at the site of the heart so during these areas that is where the problem tends to happen especially at the areas of like rib clavicle so what is going to happen is it may get fractured. So, for example, let's try to see one by one. So, for example, at the connector, what can go wrong over here? So, for example, whenever you are trying to put in the screw into the connector, what can go wrong over here? So, things like this. So, can you identify this problem? So, what is happening already over here is the set screw is already obstructing the board. This is a very, very practical problem. Similarly, so what is going to happen if you try to just insert your lead? You will not be able to go inside, right? And of course, it is going to dislodge it. So what is happening over here? Very interesting ECG. 
What is happening over here? Can someone guess? So this is what we are observing is the set screw noise. It's due to the screw noise. So if it was not tightly done, that is what will happen. Similarly, what is happening over here? What is the problem? We know over here, the distal end is the one which is notorious for dislodgement or even perforation, in fact. So how do you, how do you become sure of that? Is there will be intermittent or loss of capture? Otherwise, there is intermittent or loss of sensing as well or similarly even inappropriate therapy during the SVT. So, for example, what do you notice in this x-ray? What is happening over here? So, try to trace the leads. So, the biggest hint I would give is there's some problem with the leads. So what is happening with the leads actually? So if we look carefully, there are two leads which is coming. So one is going to the ventricle, one is going to the atrium, right? But the problem with the atrial lead is it is hanging down. So it is not really in the atrium. So there is atrial dislodgement in fact. So can you identify the dislodged lead over here? So this one, it's hanging down, right? So what is happening over here? So the atrial lead is dislodged. So how do you avoid the dislodgements? So you have to ensure a few things. So you have to ensure there's sufficient slack in the lead. Use suture sleeves. And also check for the lead tip stability during the implant. So for example, this is how is the typical curve. So you should leave a little bit of slack as well. Similarly, for the, the uh, uh, stability of the lid deep as well. So for example, this is the ventricle one as well. So you should also try to see for this. So uh, oh yes, sorry. Uh, so what is happening over here in this lead? Classical examples. So in this, what has happened is the lead tip has passed the heart. So this is the cardiac shadow. So it has been drawn to make it clear for you. It has already gone through the heart. So there is a lead perforation in fact. So how do you diagnose it? So by diagnosing, we could already sh show you that you can see it by the echo, even in the x-ray, and the threshold and the lean impedance may remain unchanged, okay? So it doesn't change at all. And uh, yes, uh, you can also ask for some of those uh, possible patient symptoms. For example, change in the blood pressure, the cardiac tamponade or dusty arm may also be there, in fact, with the patient. So that is why there are several problems which can happen with the ICD system, in fact. So we already said it about the acute problems, chronic problems, acute problems like the connector, the dislodgement, even the perforation, otherwise for the chronic problems, as I had already said it is, what the biggest problem tends to happen is lead fracture. In the lead fracture, so most commonly it will be seen in the terms of high impedance will be observed. So, can you notice carefully what is happening over here? So it has already been circled. So this is the device over here. And then this is going and something happens over here. So what does it, so what is it happening? So this is what is called as the rib clavicle crush. Due to the crushing of, between the rib and the clavicle, this is the one which causes lead fracture, okay? So then over here, what is happening? So we will try to have a closer look on the lead. This is how you will notice it, the crushing of the lead actually. So I hope you can read this question. 
can you identify the fracture? Where is it happening over here? So if you look carefully, there's slight discontinuation, right, in the lead over here. So the first one on the top goes pretty fine, but the second one over here, there's a problem, right? There's slight discontinuation over here. So this is the one which is leading to the fracture actually. So now coming to the common behavior. So as I already said, it, there are a lot of problems which can in fact happen over there. In terms like common behavior, it includes erratic sensing, or uh, there's loss of capture, intermittent loss of capture, otherwise the high lead impedance as well. So let's try to have a look. So what is Sorry. So what is happening over here? E tip to E rig. If you look at over here, it's going regular, right? However, the EGM2, V tip to V ring, something is happening in between, right? Then there is regular, then again something is again happening. So if you look carefully at the E to E interval in milliseconds, so this is going almost regular, regular, 450, 460, something. Like around those figures going regular, but in between there is uh, some long pause. However, if you look carefully above, A is A is are pretty regular, right? But something is going wrong over here. Then later on it continues. However, in the VV interval, if you look carefully, what is happening is there is a lot of like you know sensing is going on. A lot of sensing is going on. Okay, so like even at the beats of like cycle lengths of 130, 150, 180, 210, 140, like this. So what is really happening here? So what is happening is, this is the common thing which tends to happen in cases of lead fracture. So this is again another EC. So what do you notice on the ECG is, this is the EGM, I'm sorry, like EGM and ECGs are different terms, ECG is mostly used for surface ECG actually, EGM is the one, intro, uh, it's mostly used for the intracardiac uh, ECGs, you can say it like this. So what do you notice over here, there's a lot of noise coming away, right, and then it's starts to become a little bit better but again there is a lot of noise which is coming over here and between there are some okay ventricular sensing which is present in fact and that's what is it is detecting a lot of extra mm, uh, 210 120 120 120 but this is of course not right so this is due to the noise sensing and which is happening secondary to the lead fracture fact okay and then in fact it uh, over here so so we already said it there are several points of fracture the acute and the chronic ones so yes uh, if there is a lead fracture this is going to exhibit high impedance however if there is lead insulation break it tends to show normally is a low impedance so common behaviors so whenever there is an insulation break so it can affect at least three things lead impedance capture threshold and the sensing so the lead impedance will be low and it can be intermittent in fact and capture threshold will suddenly rise or there's loss of capture threshold in fact and yes it can be intermittent similarly for the sensing it can be over or under sensing and of course it can be intermittent so that is what when we see over here on a continuous basis so we notice is this is happening is due to the insulation break in fact so now coming to the issues which the device can have so what are the device problems is uh, yes sometimes there's inappropriate programming other than that uh, it may take really long time to charge and there can be sometimes the battery depletion can be quite a lot uh, quicker. So 
that is the time you have to think for elective replacement or the end of life solutions and uh, similarly what is happening is in for the inappropriate programming so you have to think for you know there's an output problem otherwise there is over or under sensing or otherwise there is an acceleration problem as well okay so what is happening over here if you get a tracing like this what is the problem do you identify So what is happening here? Okay, this is the ECG. And then if we look carefully over here, so it is detecting tachycardia sense. So what is happening is, it is detecting this part as well. So even the S part, yes, it is detecting as a QRS. But even the T segment, this part as well is being sensed as a tachycardia. So do you understand? So what is the problem? So this is called as oversensing. And if you want to be precise, what it is is T wave oversensing, in fact. Okay. So now let's try to give you a real scenario. So this is Metronic uh, uh, programming screen. You can see if you look carefully. So EGM one to EGM two, you can notice over here. Uh, so EGM one is for E tip to a ring I hope you all can get it into your mind the picture which I had already shared from my last lecture and in the two V tip to V ring okay you can notice it over here what is happening so if you look carefully what is happening is the ventricular recording is quite a lot becoming irregular and in fact if you look carefully down over here as well so what do you notice the VV intervals is going too quick right hmm? and then later on what is happening is there is no VVs at all where are the V's where are the V's so this is TP TP mode was activated so what is the reason for this although we can see the QRS right so this is the phenomenon of under sensing. So can you identify the problem? What is happening over here? So this is the surface ECG and this is the intracardiac EGM which is derived from the device. So what is happening over here? Surface ECG by looking at the rhythm, what do you think? What is happening over here? Can anyone say to me? I hope not everyone is sleeping. You can use the chat box. So what do you think is the diagnosis over here? At least look at the surface ECG and tell me what is happening in the surface ECG. At least looking at the surface ECG, tell me what is happening. No one would like to even try. This is not good. We took such a long and elaborate class and this is just, look at the surface ECG. So there is a very fast rhythm which seems to be quite a lot irregular, okay, in the, uh, but what happens in the intracardiac those, uh, recordings from the device, what do we notice over here? So this is the ventricular pace beat, this is the ventricular pace beat, then this is the ventricular pace beat and then there is the ventricular sense beat later on in fact. So what is this? So this is more of a phenomenon of, of under sensing. It is not able to sense those RI intervals because the amplitude of QRS has become so less in fact. So this is what is, okay. So what is happening over here now? 
Has anyone seen any problems like this? So what is happening in this case actually? So this device is hanging outside of the patient's skin. So now we are trying to see for the device related problems like the infection, erosion or even the allergy. And in this one is the skin over the device got literally eroded. So that's why you can even see the device actually. It is a huge and bad surgical scar just over the device. So for example if someone is allergic, so there are no uh, you know, there are test kits which is available, for example, for the polyurethrin, silicon, titanium, or even these, you know, epoxy or polysulfone uh, stuff. Similarly, so what is happening over here? So, a lot of times, uh, yeah, so what can happen is, uh, uh, one of the easy practices is leave the leads. Old leads are there, so just leave them and put fresh leads as well over there. However, due to the interference between the active and the abandoned leaves, it may cause inappropriate therapy. So one has to be careful for that. And yes, due to sometimes the sensing of the electrical signals other than the heart, so that is the one which leads to electromagnetic interference as well, which we see, see it here, in fact. So... What do we notice over here? Let's try to get into some question answer mode. So in this mode, what is happening is, there's a lot of noise coming over here, right? Those noises later on, if we notice carefully, it tends to disappear. So this has to something to do with the sensing. I'm already giving you a hint now. So what do you think? So this is over sensing. And of course due to the noise over there. Okay, so what is happening? So let's try to give you some examples. So this is a 62 year old male who was implanted for ICD actually. For VTVF in fact. However, when we try to interrogate the patient, we observed that the patient had got like 11 shocks. Can you imagine? 11 shocks the patient was having. So, let's try to solve this mystery. So, you all have to help me. So, what is happening over here? So, you are opening up the programming session. So, you can notice it carefully over here in the sense so the VT has been programmed at like 182 beats per minute VF at like this much and it should at least give 4 ATPs only then 25 joules shock then 30 joules shock like this however when we look in over here so this is the one so uh, you can see over here the, about the overview Okay, so you try to go to the signal amplitude. So in the signal amplitude, you look over here is like this is continuous 12 millivolts, and this is the one around 2.6 millivolts, for example, for the atrium and the ventricle. Do you think is it normal? Or we will have to do something. So always take a step by step approach. So you look at the summary. And you went into the signal amplitude, which is constant. However, if you look carefully at the pacing lead impedance, it suddenly fell, right? It was going up over there and then boom, it came down. So the impedance decreased. So what happened? 
so one of our always important rules is to determine so there was a therapy as we saw that therapy was given our role is always to determine was it an appropriate therapy was it an inappropriate therapy so when while reviewing the episode number 52 of out of those 60 episodes we noticed there's a lot of noise coming up over here okay So what do we further notice over here? Hmm? What is happening? So if you look carefully at the noise, so this is the atrial lead, this is the ventricular lead. So a lot of these ventricular, so there was noise which was detected as VT. So this is inappropriate therapy, which is happening due to the noise from the ventricle, okay? So, this is, if we are having a closer look now, so then of course we can detect the problem, what had happened wrong. Okay, now let's try to look another example which is related to the morphology change in the sense like, okay, there's a 72 year old female patient who had VT episodes with ICD. And yes, during the follow up, when the patient came, no, the patient didn't feel anything. So let's try to follow that approach, which we are doing for ICD interrogation. So we go to the fast path summary. Over here, we can already see, okay, uh, the episode is there with alert condition. Here we notice it over here. So what we do over here, then we look at the date, okay, choose something over here. So then what do we do is we try to go to the episode. So let's go to the episode and determine is it a appropriate or inappropriate therapy. So now what do you notice? This is the A, this is the V. So you should start looking at the markers. So if you look at the markers carefully, what is happening over here? A is followed by V, A sense, V sense, A sense, V sense, A sense, A sense, V sense. However, over here something is happening. Something is happening over here. Due to which it starts noticing this is T T T T T T T tachycardias. Hmm? So what is happening over here? So for, further, what would you like to do? So wherever it detected the VT, you should go to the step-by-step -step approach. But after this, I went to the uh, VT diagnosis details and because I wanted also to see on the morphology. So then all of a sudden, what is happening is it is showing, you know, there was a minimum match score of like 61%. And that is the reason it indicated for VT and so that is the one which caused the trigger over here then we can see it over here A V A V V V V okay so do you agree for this so this was the problem and the auto update what happens is the morphology auto update score increases to 100 in fact and this is the one over here it caused diagnosis of SVT, in fact. So now coming to this episode, so in the diagnostics. So what is happening is, so again, always try to look at the step-by-step -step approach. Step-by-step -step approach in the sense, uh, in the diagnosis, which was SVT, so you try to see that, okay, it took a time of like 4.50, okay. And then the criteria which it was it took was yes it was the rate of course and the 60 more than 60 percent is a match okay more than five out of eight matches indicate SVT in fact and the template was updated further in fact so after the morphology update correct discrimination is a SVT so this was not a VT Right, if you look carefully, isn't it? So this is a SVT. 
hmm? so after the so that is why the this is a big role for the programming of the device so one of the common things is like okay once we know about all these things what about the indications of icd therapy so ICD therapy is indicated in a patient who are survivor of the cardiac arrest due to the VF, even the unstable sustained VT. Okay. Similarly, the 1B indication for this is it should be uh, implanted in a patient with structural heart disease and spontaneous sustained VT. Okay. Similarly, it should also be given for a syncope of undetermined origin with clinically relevant or hemodynamically unstable patients. Okay, then, so for example, further 1A indication is the ICD therapy it should be given if someone's injection fraction is less than 35% due to a myocardial infarction or at least it should be more than 40 degrees of post MI with NIHA class 2 or 3. However, if someone is in less than 40 days, what would you do? Hmm? So that is the time you can give the variable cardioverter defibrillator. Okay, and wait for like 40 days. How are they doing? If they are doing all good and all, no need for any implantation. Otherwise, yes, you may have to consider implantation. Similarly, what the indication is for the patients with non ischemic DCM having a LVEF less than or equal to 35%, okay, with NIHA class of 2 or 3. And then again, 1A indication is for the patients with LV dysfunction due to prior myocardial infarction or at least 40 days post MI. So as I had said it, less than 40 days of MI, it's not an indication, okay. One has to be really, really careful for this. So again, uh, uh, okay, so this is the ICD implantation is considered reasonable for the patient who have had unexplained syncope, significant LV dysfunction or even non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy. Otherwise also, this is class C recommendation in fact, for reasonable for the patients with sustained VT and normal or near normal ventricular function. Okay. This is again considered reasonable for the patients of HCM. So if someone is having HCM as well, and yes, they are having uh, one or more major risk factors of sudden cardiac death, again, it should be indicated. Similarly, also for the prevention of sudden cardiac death in a patient who is having a ARVD or at least one or more risk factors for the sudden cardiac death, okay? Similarly, it is reasonable to reduce the sudden cardiac death in patients with long QT syndrome who are experiencing syncope or VT while receiving beta blockers. So you're, you should be at least giving beta blockers and then you are trying to do that. That is the time, yes, it can be considered in fact, okay. So that is a very uh, important uh, level to consider whenever you are thinking. And one of the key things always is before considering the ICD implantation those patients should have always received the optimal medical therapy and at least you would expect them to survive more than one year. Only that is the time you can implant them with ICD. Otherwise, no, you should not. Okay. So similarly, ICD implantation is reasonable for non-hospitalized patients who are awaiting transplantation. And ICD implantation is reasonable for patients with Brugada syndrome who have had syncope, okay? And ICD implantation is reasonable also for patients with Brugada syndrome who has had either syncope, documented VT, or of course, if someone has had um, polymorphic VT as well, or they have symptomatic with problems like cardiac sarcoidosis, chance of myocarditis, or Chagas disease as well. 
So in this as well, as you can see it over here, so yes, uh, the indications wise is, you know, the class group C of indication is for those patients with non-ischemic heart disease who have a LVF of less than or equal to 35%, even if in NIHA class 1. Similarly, if uh, someone is having a long QD syndrome with a risk factor for sudden cardiac death, Otherwise, also patients with syncope and advanced structural heart diseases, okay, uh, and yeah, invasive and non-invasive uh, testing has been done, but they are unable to identify your etio, uh, etiology for that, in fact. Similarly, with a, someone with a history of familial cardiomyopathy, otherwise LV non-compaction as well. Now, coming to the class C uh, indication. So, Therapy should not be given for the patients. As I already said, if someone's life expectancy is less than one year, better not to give. Okay, similarly, if someone is having incessant VTOVF, no, it should not be given. Similarly, it is not indicated for the patients having significant psychiatric illnesses, okay, which may be aggravated by device implantations. Otherwise, also the ICD therapy is not indicated for NIHA class 4 patients with drug refractory CHF who are not candidate for cardiac transplantation or the CRTD. And similarly, um, if someone is having a no inducible VT or without structural heart disease, so there is no need for that. Similarly, when um, you can do a catheter ablation. So, for example, if someone is having due to accessory pathway or even RVOT outflow, LV outflow track, or idiopathic VT or fascicular VT, you should try to ablate them first rather than putting up ICD therapy, okay? So, so that is why uh, similarly if there is a ventricular arrhythmia disorder which can be easily treated, it should be completely avoided, okay? And yes, similarly, if someone has had a cardiac arrest, and um, it, it uh, but without any reversible cause so then it should be again indicated as well so similarly if someone is having a congenital heart disease so again it should be indicated with recur or someone with recurrent syncope with complex congenital heart disease as well yes um, it is indicated so in this table, we have tried to summarize some of the landmark trials, okay, with the different data which we can see it over here, right from the MADIT to the SIDS trial. So we can see it over here. MADIT 1 and MADIT 2 were the landmark trials which showed us the importance of. ICD, in, in fact, especially for the prevention of sudden cardiac death. So, a lot of times, uh, a common confusion comes is what about the medical therapy versus pacing and defibrillation, especially the heart failure patients. So, companion trial was the one which tried to see, and they further observed that the CRTD tends to decrease the mortality by at least 36 percent compared with the optimal medical therapy in fact okay so this is very very important so and yes uh, about the inferiority of CRTP compared to CRTD is insufficient in fact CRTP stands for pacing and D stands for defibrillator in fact okay so now, uh, th there were several studies as well, in fact, uh, which showed that for primary prevention, at least one third of the patient should undergo the uh, implantation. Okay, the MADIT 2 trial again showed that definitely there is decrease in the overall mortality. So, the SCD heft trial is the one which showed that there is no survival benefit for the uh, really wonderful drug, like even for MR1. In fact, However, if someone is tracking the ICD therapy, in fact, there is nearly a quarter person, you know, uh, a decrease in the risk factor. 
Similarly, so the tr uh, dynamite trial was the one which uh, tried to test for the defibrillator in acute myocardial infarction. And that, when they tried to see in the arrhythmic uh, death group in the ICD group, and uh, when they tried to compare between the non arrhythmic and the arrhythmic drifts, so they found there's no difference in the total mortality at all. Similarly, in the definite trial, what happened was there was a strong trend decreasing the all cause mortality with ICD therapy, although it was not statistically significant. And that was due to all these reasons in the 2008 ACC EHA HRS guidelines. A lot of these changes which was done in fact. So if you can look at carefully about the different points and all. So I'll leave you all to read it over here in detail. Okay. Or you can just pause your screen and have a look over here. So in the meantime, are there any questions uh, which I can answer for you guys?